All right. Uh, so we have in the room. Hello, everyone. Namaste. Um, we are broadcasting from Ontario. <laughs> but we have Venerable Amasiri, Venerable Vipassi, Venerable Nandano, and Venerable Arinda, and Venerable Nalaka, <laughs> and Venerable Michelle, and Venerable Niraso. So we're a lovely crowd here. Um, we have good voices, so we're going to chant the Itipi So chant three times. And please join us. You'll, you'll be muted, but please join us uh, for this triple reflection on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And then uh, we'll do 20 minutes of meditation. I'll give some guided meditation and we'll sit quietly. Yeti piso bagawa hara ham samma sampo do vicha charana sampano sukato Sadam 
ಸಾರಥಿ ಸಾಗವತಿ ಸಭಾಗವತ So let's meditate together. We'll do about 20 minutes. I'll give some instruction and then I'll be quiet and we can sit, prepare the minds in silence. Bita, my sound is okay? Yes, Lam Pa. Can you hear us well? Good, very good, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> So, how are you doing? How does it feel where you are? Hot, cold, confused, or tranquil, noisy, quiet, whatever it is, how does it feel? A good place to start is sound. So, not notice sound. Listen in a receptive way. and then notice the silence of awareness. So the traffic could be noisy, but awareness knows noise, so awareness is silent. Make conscious the feelings in your body, go to the face, let the feelings in the mouth become conscious. So just as you can listen to sound in a receptive way, you can feel the body in a receptive way. So what does the mouth feel like? And there's vibration or some kind of feeling and the mind silently knows. It's the same silence, different object. Make conscious the feelings around your ears So I'm not asking you to concentrate. I'm just asking you to localize your attention. Let the physical sensations come into consciousness. So you're cultivating receptive awareness and noticing the silence of that receptivity. Bring attention to the nose, the bridge of the nose, the nostrils. Let that become conscious. 
Now don't tighten your eyes looking for something. Just let it come into consciousness. And the same silent knowing. Your eyes, the eye sockets, the eyes themselves. So notice our attention isn't to get something, but it is to notice what is. Not as a concept, but just the physical experience of eyes, mouth, and so on. Feel your temples. And feel the top of your head. Now feel the whole head as a mass of sensations, vibrations. And notice that that is in awareness. In, in silent knowing. Listen to sound. And notice that sound is in awareness. Feel your shoulders, arms, hands. Let that become conscious. And the same silent knowing. Be conscious the feelings at the chest. The ribs clothing on the chest, the lungs. The abdominal area, lower ribs, lower spine, all the organs in that area. Again, you're not trying to find anything, you're noticing what it is, and the same silent receptive awareness. Pelvic area, pelvic bones, the organs in the pelvic area. Uh, hips, thighs, knees, lower legs, feet. Then the whole body, feel the whole body, whole body awareness not as concept, but as changing sense experience in awareness. Listen to sound, notice that sound is in awareness. Notice the body and the body's in awareness. Be that awareness.
You could just leave it there and sit in awareness, with awareness, as awareness, or you could localize your attention to help keep track of the present moment. So feel the breathing of the body. Let the breath become conscious. Still knowing for one in breath. And still knowing for one out breath. Yeah, I'll leave you with those suggestions and let's just sit quietly.
Good evening, Long Paul. Can you hear me? Chen Ziyang, please go ahead. Yes, Long Paul. Brahma Jaloka Dipati Sahampati Hatanjali Tiwarang Ayachata Santi Dasata Araja Kajatika Dese Tudama Anukam Pimam Paja Namo Tassa, Pakawato, Arahato, Sama, Samputasa, Namo Tassa, Pakawato, Arahato, Sama, Samputasa, Namo Tassa, Pakawato, Arahato, Sama, Samputasa, Utang Damang, Sankang Namasami. So, blessings. Everyone, wherever you are, um, here at the monastery, it's all quite peaceful. We had a lovely snowfall last week or a few days ago. It's all melting now. Um, so all the usual changes of the weather entering into winter. Ourselves, we are, we're sort of winding down our work projects. We um, have a three month winter retreat, January, February, March. So. The Kutis is being finished, um, books are getting finished, and uh, all manner of things are getting finished, but the monastery never really gets finished. But in any case, we tried to put away the projects, put away the tools, and do dedicate three months to meditation practice, which is quite a privilege, uh, privilege to be a monk, but it's also our duty to develop um, the meditative life, the contemplative life, um, and, and reach some, hopefully, some deeper understanding of the Buddhist teaching so that we can be better people, um, so that we can honor, honor the Buddha's uh, recommendation for the bhikkhu life, uh, and also, obviously, that we can share some insights and somehow be helpful uh, and maybe create a sanctuary, like this monastery is a, a sanctuary for animals and people where people can come and um, where the monastery is not caught up with politics of the day and all of that, and uh, people can feel at ease. But of course, during COVID, that's not been possible. It's been, it's been a different, different kind of experience. Um, the, and the Buddhist teaching um, on meditation obviously doesn't cover everything. There's so much more in the world than just meditation. So I, you know, I think of like, to, to meditate, to be a contemplative, you have to have quite a lot of bharami or goodness going in your life. You need enough food, you need shelter, uh, you need clothing, you need medicine, you need safety, you need uh, social safety, political safety, stability. All those things are, it's very hard to meditate if, if you're starving or there's a war around you and all, and all the rest of it. So we're you know, to be able to do this is, um, is a great good fortune. And then to remember that um, if we can also help others to have enough food and to have shelter and so on, um, that helps them to realize some kind of peace and some kind of reflective capacity to contemplate Dhamma. Um, so I'm kind of, when I think of say, the Firefly Mission in Singapore, all the beautiful work that you do uh, helping in the uh, rebuilding the schools in, in, in Burma after the flooding and at work in Cambodia and the Damagiri Foundation and where you uh, help Ajahn Chagina with that orphanage and, 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 and monastery. And then the angel group who took up that, um, that initiative to bring, we had 50 doctors over three or four days at Mehong Son and treated 1200 people for all kinds of ailments. And then our own Flora Libich here, who does the work with the um, Peaceful Children's Home in Cambodia. These are, these are really beautiful initiatives that you find in, 
in, in, in, in any culture. It doesn't have to be a Buddhist culture. And that, um, that giving forth of, of generosity and giving forth of one's uh, time and energy and expertise is, uh, is, is very important for the meditative life because that honest giving, that sincere giving, it's not, it's not a duty, is it? When I, when I have a chance to serve, it's not so much coming from duty, it's coming from a place of, of opportunity, actually. Oh, I have a chance to serve. And so this is one of the things that I often reflect to our community, our monks here. When I, when I first went to Thailand and you know, people would offer me food in my bowl and I'd feel embarrassed or people would bow and, and I'd say, thank you, thank you, thank you for the food. The Thai people say, no, 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 you can't say thank you. We're grateful to you for giving us this opportunity to serve and to help. And I thought, wow, I never thought of it that way. I never really thought of it that way. So it's being a Canadian, it's very hard not to say thank you. You know, the joke in, <laughs> the joke in Canada is that Canadians will actually thank the ATM machine when they get their money. So <laughs> we're, we're really into thank you. But <laughs> just the spirit of, of, of the opportunity to give as something that one is grateful for. And I found, you know, caring for my mother was that same way. You know, I took care of my mom for a few years when she was uh, very old. And, and the more I remember that, the more I realized what an opportunity that was to care for her, to really care for her, right? And really in a, in a very, very full on, hands on way. And I could see for her, she didn't have the opportunity to care for me. And she missed that because she didn't have the energy. Um, so so that, that sense of generosity then is it really, it's, it's, it's the foundation for, for the spiritual life, isn't it? And that of course is conjoined with the foundation in, in moral restraint, not harming, not hurting, uh, being honest in relationships and so on, being sober. And, all the rest of it. So when when fellows like me, you know, I like to talk about meditation, uh, but I'm basically I'm always assuming that um, the folk listening to this kind of a talk have that in place that somehow they have a lifestyle where these aspects of the Buddhist or this aspect of any good life really it doesn't even have to be Buddhist but these aspects of generosity and and, and morality are, are very fundamental to their lifestyles. Um, so without that, then meditation could be just a sort of kind of uh, even a selfishness, you know, could be that. But within, within the lifestyle of, of morality and generosity, I think all of us yearn for, for stillness, um, even if we don't have an opportunity to do humanitarian work, even if we, you know, we're just surviving from day to day. Um, or even if we have an opportunity to do a lot of humanitarian work, all of us, all of us has this yearning for peace and stillness and silence. And when we taste that, we all think, yeah, I'd like a, a bit more of that. Thank you very much. And all of us also want to be free from the, the, the kind of seeming end the cycles of the emotional turmoil or, 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 you know, the kind of suffering of the inner world. So this is, a, these are common themes that the Buddha points to, um, also, I guess in, in these kinds of talks, so I assume people are, are, have a, are honoring the precepts and, and living a life of generosity. I also assume, I think that they have a, a basic understanding of the Four Noble Truths, uh, that, you, you know, that you have to have some kind of intellectual grasp of, of, the, uh, of the Buddhist teachings to understand the forest tradition, because from the forest tradition, we usually speak spontaneously from the feeling in the heart, and there's a kind of um, assumption that the basic foundations, the Four Noble Truths are understood by the listener. Uh, if I was in, obviously, if I went to a, a school and kids didn't know anything about Buddhism, I would, you know, introduce some basic things like that. So that's one of the assumptions I make. Also, if I'm talking about meditation, I also assume that people have, uh, you know, they're serious about meditation, that, that it's not just a, uh, a kind of trivial thing that you pick up every week once you know for 15 minutes that actually there's a serious intent and and serious uh, dedication to meditation practice because you really 
anything you do, whether it's it's craft or accounting or um, whatever doctoring, whatever you have, you have to put time into it. You have to really develop the craft and the craft of the heart or the craft of meditation uh, doesn't come easy. Very few people find it easy. So it does take a kind of uh, dedication of time. Um, so with all that in place, uh, with all those assumptions, uh, so if you're a newbie to this, please excuse me if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so in, in it, there is possibility uh, in, in our human experience to, to touch something that is always there, uh, a deep silence, uh, a peacefulness which is not dependent on experience, um, an island, a refuge, uh, a harbor, um, and 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 that possibility is is the uh, really I think why we're meditating. We're not just meditating to tranquilize the mind or just to solve our problems, but to to come to that uh, realization again and again and again. So one of the two of the things that when people ask me, what what would what would you consider to be um, signs of progress in your meditation? And I would say it's, it's um, confidence and the, the ability to repeat, the, the ability to do this again and again and again. So there's a kind of confidence and a competence. And the confidence comes from insight. And, and, and the, the, the competence comes from being able to repeat that insight again and again and again. Now, you, you might think that, well, success in meditation would mean uh, that I, every time I sit down, I feel peaceful. <laughs> then you'd be in trouble because maybe Maybe you have the flu, maybe you had a lot of, you know, bad business meeting or whatever. Um, but if, if, if confidence is not about a, if confidence is about insight or understanding, then that should be something that's applicable all the time. And if that's a true understanding, then you should be able to apply it again and again and again and get similar results, I would say. Now, if, if you think that like meditation is reaching some kind of state of peacefulness that you manipulate and you get and you create and you form and you can do it every time, then you can feel very frustrated you know? because the nature of our emotions, the nature of our bodies and so on is that we are subject to all kinds of things, pain, uh, and, and any given meditation is always very, very different. So I wouldn't see meditation as a tranquilizing of the mind or an attempt to get a, a particular state of mind, but it's the noticing of something that we tend not to notice. When you, when you meditate, one of the things you find you do is, you, let's say you, you choose to do the breath, or you choose to um, do metta bhavana or whatever you do. And then you find yourself thinking, 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 thinking. And, and then what people do is they, they perceive themselves as the thinker and then they try to get rid of thinking. Now thinking, it's not that you are thinking deliberately. Thinking is a natural phenomena that comes into consciousness through memory. Now we are memory beings. So I need memory to know that this is a clock and that this is water. So my whole perceptual life is built up of memory. I need functional memory to know that I'm Viridamo, that I'm a senior monk here, that my room is over there and so on. If I didn't have that, then I'd have dementia. So that's all ordinary functional memory. But what happens in in, um, in meditation is that some memory gets stimulated and that 
that memory comes up into consciousness and then a bunch of thinking takes off from there. And that thinking is very much narrative thinking, storyline thinking. So for instance, if um, uh, I had a meeting with someone and it was, let's say I had a job interview and the job interview maybe didn't go well. And then I start to meditate then they get a memory of that job interview and that it didn't go well. And the mind runs into narratives and stories, right? I should have said this, or I should have said that, I shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe I, I plan to go to Thailand next year and I'm looking at flights and I'm thinking, oh, is it gonna, you know, will the vaccine come out? And then I meditate and then the memory of that comes up. And there I am, I'm in Thailand, I'm planning, so these kinds of memories are what we call narrative memories or storyline memories. And when you're a meditator, I think what happens is you, you notice the storyline and you say to yourself, I'm thinking too much. So you, 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 kind, of, you kind, of kind of blame yourself. And what we don't see or what we need to see, and this is part of the insight of coming to the peace of mind, that thought is simply stimulated, this kind of thought is stimulated through memory. So if you begin to see that link, that link that this is just memory, I mean, it's a very simple thing, but if you begin to notice memory as an object in your meditation, rather than perceive yourself as the person who shouldn't be thinking, you begin to let go of what we call self-perception. You begin to see the dharma of thought. You see thought as thought. You see memory as memory. And that needs to, be, you need to train in that. You need to um, make that suggestion to yourself. So you can do that like in meditation, you can say to yourself, I'm, I'm you know, when I, as I'm meditating on the breath or whatever, I'm gonna notice memory. I'm gonna see how memory creates thought or something like that. You don't have to say much, but you do have the intention behind them. And as you're meditating, you'll get better and better at noticing with this memory, you get this train of thought. So what happens there is that you're, what, you're, what you're really encouraging is awareness and you're discouraging the tendency to try to get rid of thought or to do something about the thought or analyze the thought. Now that's the kind of first step. Now once you, once you can see that happening, once you can see that happening, what you begin to see is that the very sense of a narrative creates a sense of a person and that that person is in time. It's like me uh, going from the past to the future. So if you're observing your thinking mind as you're meditating, you'll notice the difficulty of actually staying in the present moment. Your mind will going past, future, past, future, past, future. And it just keep doing that all the time. And, and if, you, if you can see that actually in that moment when you notice thinking, the perception of time, um, that's all it is. That idea that you are a person in time, moving through time, is just the perception. And that the knowing is always there. So what we do is we, we think we have not been aware and we identify with self, but self is not permanent. Self is, a, is, a, is an up and, it's an in and out thing. It's born and dies, born and dies, but knowing is always there. Awareness is always there. And we don't realize that because we identify with the thinking. We identify with the narrative. And then we make another narrative of the, of the fellow who has to get rid of thinking. So if you can then, like when you notice the narrative and, and notice that that perception that I have been thinking is a definition of self and time, you will also notice that the knowing is always there. The knowing was never away. It was never lost. It never went anywhere. It was always there. And that brings you to the deep silence of the mind. In that knowing, you see, well, that knowing is always there. The thoughts of self come and go. The identity of self come and go. Because that's all self is. Your real, real home is that deep silence. And you don't, we don't notice it because our attention is out into trying to fix the object, trying to fix the thinking, trying to get rid of the thinking. So then what do we do is maybe we really try hard to hold on to the object of meditation. Oh, we try really hard, which is okay, but you're still, attention is still on an object. 
And you don't notice actually that the knowing is not an object. It's the still silence. The still knowing is always there. And, and because it's always there and because it's not dependent on an object, uh, we, we, we fail to notice that because we think that the object of our experience is pleasure, becoming something, getting something, getting rid of something. And, and, and so we're, we're kind of, we're, it's like you have to turn around and look back at awareness itself. Once you start to, and, and this is where I would say uh, right understanding and confidence comes. You, you, you begin to see that, that meditation isn't about an object. It's about the knowing. And as you, as you get that understanding, it's, 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 it's ephemeral in the beginning. It's just like a taste, you know, it's not, not so strong, but you, you get that sense of it doesn't really matter if it's sound or breath or, or emotion or pain. It doesn't really, really matter. It's about the knowing, it's about the knowing. And as you, as you then see the narratives of self blossom into mind, you say, well, that's just memory and habit. That's all it is. And then you see, well, that knowing has been there all the time through that, you touch the silence of the mind. You touch it really very profoundly in that moment, because that's the gap. In that moment, there's a gap, an entryway into that silence, which is always there. If, however, your attention is always outwards, and now we need to pay attention. If you're doing humanitarian work, yeah, you need to, you need to do humanitarian work. You need to pay attention, you need to organize things, you need to do a lot of work. So I'm not saying that our whole life is this, but because, um, because much of our life is always out, we don't know how to rest the mind. We find it difficult to actually rest the mind because even when we meditate, our, our mind is churning over the problems of the day and then we try to get rid of that and so on. But if you begin to see that this movement from past to future, defining self um, is, is simply a perception. I am someone who is thinking too much is a perception in time. And if you see that's just an object, then you're taken to the silence, to the harbor. Uh, and that is a very profound and deep silence. Uh, and that's where, where you get the sort of um, the skillfulness, the skillfulness of remembering this same insight. So it's not the same as, as like, you, you kind of get really, really like skillful at, at controlling something, say, um, if I'm doing woodwork, like this year, I've, I've used a router a lot and I get much more skillful at using a router or, or a chisel or a saw. Okay, that's the usual way we look at proficiency in craft, right? That I can take an object and I can control it and manipulate it to give me a result. This is important. This is how we make, um, if we don't have any skills, we can't do humanitarian work. We can't feed the family, we can't feed ourselves. So that's important. But then if you try to translate that into meditation, then you're always the doer trying to hold something, organize something to create this good result called peace. And you might be able to do that for a while, but as soon as the causes and conditions are not there, it falls apart. So what people sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll have a good meditation right? And then they'll try to repeat that good meditation for days and days and days and years and years and years even on a retreat. They'll have a, I had a really great meditation. So they think it's about an experience, getting an experience, and their minds are outwards looking for the experience. And if the experience is not what they hope and expect and want, then they struggle with that. They try to get rid of it. And one of the common things we try to get rid of is we try to get rid of thought. Thought is natural. You know, thought's just the consequence of being intelligent and so on. But um, there, is, there, is a, there is an avenue that is not dependent on thought that we can begin to see behind thought, behind thought, and so that's the deep silence. So when I, when I'm suggest, I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but when, when I'm suggesting that you, you, when like I say, listen, the way I, you know, teach meditation, listen to sound. And, and what am I doing there? I'm not asking you to really worry about the sound itself. I'm asking you to notice the stillness of knowing. Yeah? And then I say, you know, feel the body. And then it's the same stillness of knowing, isn't it? 
Now that same stillness of knowing is there when, when thought is moving, but we're sent to be, we tend to be so, um, um, stuck onto the whole self thinking, the self narrative, me and what I was and what I will be. And that's all driven by habit, the habit of worry, the habit of fantasy, the help, habit of doubt, um, whatever, whatever. So, so not only do you have memory in a, in a very basic sense, stimulating thought, you have 20, 30 years of habit stimulating anxious thoughts, 20, 30 years of habit um, stimulating resentful thought or fantasy thought or whatever it is. So uh, it's not so easy to notice this. It's not so easy to notice this. But if you, if you kind of begin to trust that it's not fixing the anxiety, you're not trying to fix your emotions, that you can do through therapy or through counseling or whatever. Okay, that's okay. But it, this isn't so much trying to get the perfect emotional construct or uh, to have a loving feeling all the time. No, these are good things, love is good and so on, but this is something transcendent, not transcendent in the way that you float away from life, but within life, within the complexity of life, within the complexity of your habits and all of that, there's always this deep silence, right? And it's noticed when you notice that thought is an object, that it's, it's the time itself is an object, why is it that we can only know the present moment? We can see the consequences of past and future. We can see the winter changes to the summer and so on and so forth. But what well, we can only know the present moment and we don't contemplate that. We identify with past and future. And that was so our thoughts run. So you, you, if you look like, if, you're, if you just look at a day's activity, mental activity, how much of it is useful? And how much of it is just mulling over the future or regretting the past? Now, as a contemplative, what you're trying to do is not just in, in meditation, but in ordinary life, when life is not demanding your concentration, demanding your attention, and, and life is just very neutral, and the mind floats away, we're trying to, to see that, that this deep silence is there too. It's always there. It's not something that's just limited to meditation. Peace, which is limited to meditation, you can do that. Sure, people do that. They control their minds, they control environments, and they build a structure of, of stillness and silence, which then they can hold and maintain when all the conditions are there. That's certainly how I started. And, and so I'd have some kind of beatific experiences and, and it kind of felt really, really good and so on and so forth. But then when the causes and conditions weren't there, you know, when, when, um, when I had to work or had to relate in a more complex ways and so on, then of course the peace wasn't there. And I realized, well, that peace was a constructed thing. It was built up from, uh, uh, from sense deprivation, from constantly focusing on the breath or whatever I was doing. And so, so not letting any sense input come in. And so the result was very tranquilized, but it wasn't free. It was dependent. It was nice, but I soon realized, well, so what? So I spend 10 days tranquilizing the mind, and then I get out of that environment, the cause and conditions aren't there, then same old, same old. I began to see that, it, that that for me, at least, I don't know about you, that for me didn't make any sense because the ideas of, of Buddhist liberation are that they're not constructed. This isn't a constructed ex experience. So what is, what is not constructed, right? You think about it. your emotions are constructs, dependently originated, your body, social environments, whole sense of self as a construct, right? What isn't, what is not constructed? A and that's that still knowing. That's why it's transcendent. So then you begin to see that even within emotional turmoil, you, you can begin to see, well, emotional turmoil is in awareness. You still feel the, 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 the body maybe with its emotional turmoil. It'll still want to create thoughts of emotional turmoil. But what happens is the sort of, what is it? It's the, it's the, the uh, 
what's the word? It's the, the intense feeling that I have to fix this, the kind of intense identification with this, that begins to fall away because you see that it's just dependently originated. It's just memory and habit and, and it has an energy and if you don't feed it, it dies out. And, and so the kind of worry about all of this, the kind of self-fearfulness around it, the concern, it, and that begins to fall away and it's no big deal. It's just emotional turmoil. It's just pain, right? Because why? Because now you understand that the real refuge is not emotional. It's not social. It's not physical. It's not environmental. We have to deal with all those, sure, but it's something much more, much more profound. And it's not constructed. It's not made up because it's always there. And that's the only thing that makes sense to me about the Buddha's uh, teachings on enlightenment. If it's something that's made up and constructed, then it will, and then it will born, it'll be born, it'll die, won't it? So what is not born and not dying? And that's that still knowing, which is always there. So a reference point is no longer going out into sense experience, but it's looking at the knowing itself, being aware of awareness. So then we have both. We have humanitarian life. We have ethical life. We have social responsible life, right? So in the monastery here, we try to create an environment where, where, where men can train, uh, where lay people can come and join us. We try to take care of the animals and we have all the problems of any worldly concern. We have an infestation of gypsy moths and caterpillars, which chewed up a lot of our trees and we have ticks and we have Lyme's disease and we have snow and we have ice and we have deer and we have porcupines and we have humans. <laughs> and we have all the, you know, this is the ordinary stuff of, of, of existence. And we try to do the best we can. So that's one part of our life. And, and that's the social part of our life. And that's very, very important to try to do that well. But then that other part, what is the spiritual part of our life? What is that? Is that emotional jest? Is it just about like loving everyone all the time? Or is it even more profound than that? are not like generosity, compassion, kindness, honesty. These are, these, are, these are the methods, I would say, the methodology for understanding this, for, for noticing, not understand, well, understanding, yeah, understanding, yeah, but also noticing. It's an understanding that is noticed. And, and so um, like the, the monastery, um, it, it's, its existence, say, the work we do here, and we work hard on both on our meditation and, and to make this a, a good place. Um, that's the method. We, I don't like. I don't expect the monastery ever to be finished. <laughs> I've been I've been building monasteries or part of monasteries my whole life, and it's never going to be finished. People are never finished, right? <laughs> There's always going to be problems and difficulties and harmony and disharmony, and that. And yet you have to do your best, don't you? But the doing your best is the method. Generosity is the method, compassion is the method. And what does that do? That creates a foundation of confidence, to some extent joy, right? And then from that foundation or, or from, from that method, you begin to abide with an interest in something which is not dependent. What is not dependent? What is not dependent originated, it was not constructed. And so that's a kind of contemplative question you ask yourself to make yourself really bright and attentive into the present moment. What is it that doesn't change? So if my attention is like into thinking, that changes, so what's unchanging? And if you can get that question in as you're meditating, rather than, oh, I'm thinking too much, ask yourself, what is, did, was I really unaware? You know what you were thinking. You know that you were thinking about yesterday or tomorrow. That knowing is there. But you, you, you perceive the sense of self as being something permanent. That's what's impermanent. It's a kind of opposite kind of thing. So then the question, if, if you put this kind of contemplative question to yourself as you're meditating. Now, obviously, you know, a lot of people won't get this. <laughs> But, but this is really, to me, it seems the heart of the, of the Buddha's realization is that question like, 
okay, in this experience, what's unconstructed, what's unchanging? What is, what is not begin and end? And that question you cannot answer through thought. You can try, but you just get another question. That question brings you to silence. And then you see, well, is it not that silent knowing itself? The question is its answer. This is the, this is the kind of paradox of it. And then when you start to get confidence in that, you also get the skill. You get the skill of returning, the, the ability to repeat that because it does work and it isn't dependent on your emotional state. So then your meditation starts to not be bothered with like pain or emotional turmoil or thought. That's not, it's just some stuff. Some stuff is going on. You're not trying to control things or, or get rid of things, but you're just remembering, oh, there's the knowing. And, the, and, and, and that kind of returning into that silent place, or remembering that silent place. So it's a different use of memory, not memory as me, self-narrative, but now remembering that silence, huh? always there, has to be the only way it makes sense. So there's some ideas for you to contemplate. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's the kind of stuff I enjoy. <laughs> um, remember, it's in the context of good living. You know, it's not just sort of um, some kind of abstract so that are real. Beta, are there any questions from folk? Um, Long Paul, would you like to open the floor to direct questions now? Because I'm uh, coming from the spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, we could we could open to the floor. Okay, thank you, Long Paul. Um, perhaps Sun Xiang, could you do the Anuradhana for Sun Xiang? Yes. Uh, let's all say three sadhus together. Handamayam o vadagatha sadhu karangadamase sadhu. 